Today, we're looking back at the 1920s and 1930s to better understand the interrelationships of art and political economy in the Weimar Republic, the Soviet Union, and the United States of America during the interwar period. Welcome to the new <clears throat> man as man machine in our series, Flight of Fight, Stories of Artists Under Repression. I'm Rachel Stern, Executive Director <coughs> of the Fritz Usher Society for <coughs> Persecuted, <coughs> Ostracized and Banned Art based in New York. Today, I'm honored to introduce art historian, independent curator and author Eckhard Gillen, who received his doctorate from the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Heidelberg. He has organized numerous exhibitions and published widely on Russian, American and German art of the 20th century. Among his exhibition catalogs and books are German art from Beckmann to Richter, Images of a Divided Country, Yale University Press 1997, Art of Two Germanys, Cold War Cultures 1945 to 89, Lachmar Los Angeles, Berlin, Nuremberg with Stephanie Barron in 2009, Art in Europe 1945 to 68, Facing the Future, Bosa Brussels, that ZMK, C, ZKM Karlsruhe Pushkin Museum Moscow with Peter Weibel 2016-17, Flashes of the Future, the art of uh, the <clears throat> 68ers, Ludwig Forum Aachen with Andreas Beitlin, elected by AICA Germany for exhibition of the year 2018, Constructing the World, Art and Economy, 1919 to 1939 in USA, Germany and Soviet Union, Kunsthalle Mannheim with Ulrike Lorenz, 2018. He published books on German, Russian and American art in the 20th century, including Feindliche Brüder, Der Kalte Krieg und die Deutsche Kunst, 1945 bis 1990. Um, Hostile Brothers, The Cold War and German Art, 1945 to 1990, Berlin, 2009. And The New Man as Man Machine, Bonn, <clears throat> Berlin, 2023. Gillen has received numerous distinctions, including AICA USA 2009 for Best Thematic uh, Museum Show, the Friedlieb Ferdinand Runge Award, 2011, and Federal Cross of Merit 2022. He's visiting lecturer for art and his, for art history at the Film University Konrad Wolf in Potsdam Babelsberg. After the talk, there will be time for Q and A, so please post your questions in the chat. Welcome, Eckhart. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, welcome, dear friends and colleagues. It's not so easy to summarize a book with 450 pages and 348 images, but I try my best. 15 years after the great financial crisis of 2008, which shook the capitalist economic system in America and Europe to its foundations, the book The New Man as a Man Machine presents for the first time the interrelationship of art and political economy in the Weimar Republic, the Soviet Union, and the United States of America during the interwar period, 1919 to 1939. By taking a look back at the 1920s and 30s, 30s uh, the book attempts to better understand our own era and its well-founded fears with regard to a world in turmoil and a new global economic crisis. While writing this book, the coordinates of world politics change dramatically. We are currently experiencing a return of author authoritarian regimes, right-wing populism, and impending trade war with custom duties and growing xenophobia or even open racism. This is true for all three countries compared here. Parallel to the experience that Karl Einstein noted in 1930, definitions are once again shifting imperceptibly and invisibly. The long forgotten novel, It Can't Happen Here by Singler Lewis, which describes in 1935, instead of Roosevelt's re-election in 1936, the victory of a right-wing radical by the name of Berzelius Windrip, 
who establishes a fascist dictatorship, gained new topicality in America after Trump's election victory in 2017 and has been reprinted in the same time in Germany as well. Now we are confronted again with his possible re-election in November uh, 2024. The book focuses on how artists reacted to the central questions of the political economy in these three paradigmatic cultures and national economies of the interwar years. How, do, how did they deal in the United States, for example, with the question, can free markets advance people's pursuit of happiness better than the state in the form of a controlled capitalism or state capitalism? Is a process of consistently economizing and rationalizing all areas of life, as well as the technical industrial progress, the deregulation and the global effects of an international market that makes all traditional bonds, regions and localities disappear, compatible with a dignified life? Or are there alternatives? Can a rational socialist planned economy overcome the negative consequences of capitalism? Does a world of machines demand a new type of human being or is this a humanizing of work on machines conceivable? Alternative models for a state-guided economy by developed in the Soviet Union, for example. But in the German Empire and the United States, National Socialism and New Deal both began simultaneously in March 1933. Roosevelt, however, only planned a temporary suspension of the global market policy, while Hitler aimed for a permanent policy of autarky. From the perspective of today, it can therefore be shown that a society in a particular situation gets exactly the art it requires so as to reflect on its situation. For the period of time selected, this is a technology-affirming, streamlined art of neue Sachlichkeit, new objectivity in Germany, while it corresponds with precisionism in the United States and with the dynamic urbanism of society of the easel artists in the Soviet Union. Artists reacted to the great crisis of 1929, then with rationalism, <coughs> native art and socialist realism. All three art movements attempted to once again blur the hard contrast of modern life and to address traditional values such as a commitment to rural life, family and community. So you have a big change in 1929 from this precisionism and uh, neue Sachlichkeit to this regionalism native art. So I start with avant-garde and war, the first world war, the great war. Numerous artists of expressionism yearned for the coming war, which when it broke out was witnessed based on the experience with the Walker materialism of the years of rapid industrialization in Germany as an inner necessity, as a search for authentic authenticity, truth and self-fulfillment. Its prophet was Nietzsche. They went into the First World War with Zarathustra in their kit bags. When Nietzsche wrote, we are delighted with all who love, as we do, danger, war, and adventures. The painter Franz Marc in Munich, a member of the artist group Der Blaue Reiter, responded in his field post letters that the war had needed to come. Quotation, because we could no longer stand to lie of European morals. Bloodshed is better than an eternal lie. The war is just as much atonement as it is a self-created sacrifice to which Europe submitted in order to become a pure, become pure within itself. The profundity of German culture was played off against the materialism and the utilitarian thinking of civilization in France and England, while the materialism of its own society was blanked out. In November 1914, the beginning of the, uh, the, in the first period of the war, Georg Simmel, the philosopher, explains that this war was about a new type of man who defends his wholeness. Roman uh, Robert Musil, 
takes up this topos in his novel, The Man Without Qualities, published in 1930, when he has Walter say, quote, a man today who still aspires to integrity deserves a lot of credit. But Ulrich, the man without qualities, contradicts him. There's no such thing anymore. There's no longer a whole man, a whole man confronting a whole world, only a human something moving about in a general cultural medium. What stands out in these figures of speech are the disastrous experiences of the first war to be conducted industrially. The individual subject is subjugated in a literal sense as a mechanically functioning of component of a military machinery with which the idea of the individual who still wanted to measure up with the enemy gallantly in hand-to-hand -hand fight disappeared once and for all. Only 1% of those killed in action died of wounds they had received in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. The merging of man and machine continued to take place during the war with the increasing development and use of prosthesis and cosmetic half mask that were supposed to conceal faces disfigured by injuries. Torn to pieces and mutilated by grenades, the bourgeois dream of wholeness and character finds its cool end. And we can see that here with Max Beckmann's grenade from 1915, an etching which shows the moment of the explosion of the grenade. And on the right side, you see Alice Lex Nerlinger, a prosthetic man, which exists only of, of, uh, of, prosthetic, of prosthetic. The first world, the first world war accelerated the dissolution of the German expressionist who had yearned for, yearned for war so as to achieve new triumphs. You can see that in the change from George Goss, the metropolis on the right side, which is futuristic and expressionistic, uh, an example uh, to show the metropolis as a battlefield in contrast on the left side to Hannah Höch's collage, which is using the images of the Berliner Illustrierte Zeiten and shows that this is the perfect dissolution of society. The time for idealistic expressive art had come to an end. It was replaced by Neue Sachlichkeit, <clears throat> which paid homage to the materialism so scorned by the expressionists. In Russia, we are confronted with a conflict between the adherents of the visible reality, the Westerners, we have the same conflict today uh, in Europe with, with Russia, and the adherents of a culture of the East. The neo primitivists demonstrated in the Futurist opera Victory Over the Sun, um, which was performed on the stage of the Lunar Park uh, in St. Petersburg in 1913, on the eve of the Great War, and is a uh, which is a dark, crude parody about representatives of a positivist worldview, which is part of the Westerners, yeah, the belief in this uh, positivist world war. A grave digger wearing a black square on his breast, that's Malevich black square, which comes out of this opera, and he realized it first time in 1915, as a wearing this black square on his breast appears in order to bury the sun, a symbol of the visible rationally ordered and logically structured world. You see, this is the same conflict today uh, to, say, to turn away from, from the Western economic and rational uh, system. Uh, we see on the right side, uh, opera curtain, victory of, over the sun. Perhaps due to the lack of, to lack of experience with the dark sides of industrialization and modernization in underdeveloped Russia prior to the First World War, they did not shy away from absolute urbanism. The October Revolution of 1917 was followed by a pragmatic constructivism that took up the promise of artists to design a new society as production art. Karl Einstein, an expert on French Cubism, spoke mockingly of a somewhat shabby utopia. One battles individualism with an infallible instrument, numbers. 
And you see as, ex ex um, uh, as uh, example of uh, this kind of engineering art, Elisitsky's version of Victory of the Sun, which was done 10 years later in 1923. The United States became a global economic power after the World War, but it lacked a cultural identity so long as Europe provided the Americans with their artistic models. Overcoming this aesthetic guardianship of the still young nation by Europe was a problem that artists needed to address. Marcel Duchamp, he deserted French army and came to the United States, who was the best known mediator from then on between Europe and America, also explained in 1917, the only works of art that America has given are her plumping and her bridges. And an early example done by an Italian immigrant, the painter Joseph Stella, is the voice of the city of New York interpreted the bridge. Uh, it's uh, Brooklyn Bridge. In the early 1920s, on a roundabout way via a Europe-American avant-gardist, unloved and little notice in their own country, discovered in the machine aesthetics, in the bridges, in the elevated railways, the urban canyons flooded with light, skyscrapers in industrial landscape, their own country as an American scene. This term, while initially used in connection with the painting of the precisionist, later came to include also the social realists and the rationalists as well. Cool conduct, yeah. It's the age of cynical reason. With the new techniques of montage and meta-mechanics, Dada, the artistic movement founded in Zurich in 1916, paved the way for the new approach to the art of verism and objectivity. With their protest against any sentimentality in art, against any interpretation or idolization. In his study, Cooled Contact from, by Helmut Leiden shows after the Third War um, that due to the des uh, destabilization of society, the transition from a wartime to a peacetime economy, familiar orientation patterns were invalidated and the pessimistic Anthropology gained the upper hand with the realization that humankind tends toward destruction and that the barbaric core lies beneath the thin veneer of civilization. Helmut Blessner wrote a book uh, about the limits of community in 1924 and, and uh, argued, uh, argues in favor of a culture of distance, distance and civilized behavior. In place, of soul, emotion, the ma he said, uh, the mask and the rituals of objectivity, coolness and reserve are now important. In the icy draft of the modern age, at the beginning of the 1920s, artists had to practice intrepidness and vigilance. They assumed the position of observers with a cold diagnostic gaze. So as not to be overtaken or even overrun by developments, they looked at the world in an absolutely matter-of-fact way. George Cross adapted this pitiless stance, the need to be a machine against himself and others in 1920, when he painted, you see on the left, construction in 1920, the grid-like facades of the metropolis and faceless robots, but above all, when he constructed himself as a machine being in his watercolor collage, now marries her pedantic automaton, George, in May 1920. John Hartfield is very glad of it. You see that on the right side, see uh, Eva Peter, his, uh, his, his wife, uh, looking back to him on this machine, which she touches with her hands very carefully because this machine is very, very dangerous for her. Around 1920, Gross switched from chaotic, nervous, expressive paintings, you saw that uh, Metropolis painting, and graphic works to an objective and constructive art, which besides Italian Pittura Metaphysica also took up Soviet Russian constructivism, however, only familiar with from hearsay. In describing his change of style in 1921, Gross wrote about the need to purify the world image 
of supernatural powers of gods and of angels in order to sharpen people's vision of their realistic relation to their surroundings. He also argued for the objectivity of the subject and the sense of the practicality and clearness of a technical drawing. With the painting Grey Day from 1921, all the criteria named were realized in the transition to a social critical verism. The composition of grid light facades drawn precisely with a straight, straight edge, which look as if they were produced on a drawing table, frame a space stage on which a brick wall in the process of being constructed rigorously divides the two social spheres as a social barrier. In the foreground dominates a righteous public official who still referred to in Gross original title as a state functionary for the welfare of the war disabled. Gross confronts the manager of post-war misery with an iron angle under his arm as evidence of his right angle thinking. And he is confronted with a war cripple whose left arm is missing and whose face is disfigured by scars and operations. His uniform is flapping around his disabled body, just barely holding it together. Now we come to Weimar Republic, Inflation, Objectivity and White Socialism. In his Memories of 1923, Sebastian Hafner describes his hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic, which impoverished the middle class. Quote, None but Germany has undergone the fantastic grotesque extreme, the unending bloody Saturnalia, in which not only money, but all standards lost their value. Karl Hubuch is an artist who put these delusional, unreal, uncanny characteristics of the period of inflation down on paper in drawings and dry point, dry point during his time in Berlin. In his lithograph, Intoxication of Going Astray from 1922, Hubuch shows himself in the middle of this unfettered world gone wild with a wide open eye in profile two times as an observer of the tumultuous happenings. His view of the chaos in the inflation period focuses on the madness, the mass hysteria and the uncanny while avoiding any sort of moralizing. With the appointment of Gustav Stresemann as Chancellor of the Reich by a grand coalition government in 1923 and the introduction of the Rentenmark in November with which the inflation was brought to an end, a phase of relative stabilization began lasting until the global economic crisis of 1929. There are only a few years, about five years. Thanks to the Doors plan, money flowed from the United States, which had vast financial means at its disposal from the sale of military equipment to its allies, England and France. And it, it's, it's really flowed directly into the economy of the German empire. America thus ensured a large capital and business market for itself in the future. The dollar sun now rose over Germany and in the following six years until 1929 gave the country a certain prosperity which led to a liberalization of social life above all in the German capital Berlin, the Stresemann era. Around 1923, Hubuch translated this change of political constellations into a political allegory, the chalk drawing, Mr. Stresemann and a piece of black bread. With this turnabout in German politics, healthy American business principles were now also supposed to find their way to Germany and the spirit of objectivity was meant to heal a German society torn apart by class struggles. The Dorfplan nurtured hope of a white socialism, which was to provide a solution to the social question without calling capitalist modes of production based on the harmony of capital and work into question. In 1922, Georg Scholz brought the lords of the world together in a fictitious scene on a steel bridge over a vast river scape 
with high mountain range in the background. The individuals concerned include the physiognomically unmistakable industrial baron Hugo Stennis, whose belly is depicted as an open safe. In the middle, Walter Rathenau with an armed bandage around his waist, and on the right, Karl Legin, the trade union boss, with a metal cap, a pipe, and a pointed stylus in his hand, which appears here as allegories for the social spheres of the economy, politics, and trade unions. Scholz shows how Walter Rathenau, standing symbolically between the representatives of capital and labor, communicated the Stinnes Legin Agreement in November 15, 1918, which guaranteed the recognition of the workforce as a partner in the negotiations of wages on the same level as companies for the first time. This made possible, among other things, the eight hour workday and made leisure time a concept for employees as well. The word weekend made the wrongs in the mass media in the 1920s in Germany. In November 1923, the German translation of Henry Ford's autobiography, My Life and Work, was published in Leipzig, which, like the Russian translation, was reprinted several times in quick succession. Fordism and Taylorism became models for industrial rationalization in Germany and the Soviet Union at the same time. The Puritan principle of Fordism and Americanism merged with the ethos of objectivity, which Heinrich Mann made the motto of his protagonist in the novel, The Loyal Subject. Quote, to be impartial is to be German. Stalin was also enthusiastic about objectivity and in, already in 1924, also compared it to one of the foundations of Leninism, the Leninist style in work. Quote, American efficiency is that indomitable force which neither knows nor recognizes obstacles. So one can really speak from Leninism and Fordism as comparable systems uh, in this uh, time of the 1920s. Between 1924 and 1929, during the period of relative stabilization, objectivity became a key concept in politics, economics, advertising, philosophy, science, art and literature, and then in film as well. In all three national cultures, this new style, which addressed the dynamic changes in cities and landscapes resulting from industrialization and urbanization, had nothing to do with a naive natural, uh, naturalism. No, it's, uh, it's a reality um, designed as constructed and assembled, the artificiality of their construction is inscribed in the compositions of the pictures. Above all, in Germany, Neue Sachlichkeit was assessed on the left as reactionary and stuffy, but criticized on the right wing uh, for its in unvanished materialism of facts and the lack of positive ideals. Now we come to the Soviet Union, the objectivity of the revolutionaries, they took up this economic system, the Taylorism, the Americanism, and um, also this uh, idea of, uh, yeah, Fordism in a way. The October Revolution in Soviet Union was followed by a year-long civil war, as we know, conducted with unimaginable savagery, savagery on both sides, which could first be brought to an end in 1921. But then, revolution, civil war, and war communism had destroyed all the previous classes, the nobility, the bourgeoisie, and working classes, apart from the peasants. The first violent attempts to realize socialism at a single stroke resulted in dramatic shortages of supplies, peasant uprisings, and worker strikes. We can see here on this painting by Clement Redko, part of this group Ost of the uh, Stankovisten, uh, the painting Uprising from 1924. It is demonstrating the dystopia of a centralized state system in form of a geometric pattern. In the middle is Lenin, 
directing uh, his uh, central committee. The party consequently decided to introduce a new economic policy in order to improve the catastrophic supply situation in the countryside by means of decentralization and partial reprivatization in agriculture, trade, industry, and other sectors. This measure was explicitly considered to be just a temporary break in the battle, with the aim of finishing the total remodeling of ownership structures and completely eliminating the market economy afterward. A group of graduates of the Higher Art and Technical Studios in Moscow, already mentioned as a group OST, commented um, the new situation with satirical graphic works, um, as we are also familiar with in the works of Dix, Gross, and Schlichter. We see here Alexander Danica longing for the fine life, and on the right side, Juri Pimenov, The Race from 1928. The artists who described themselves as artistic commentators were were reacting to the new type of the Napman, who were extremely rich and showy, but loyal to the Communist Party. As after the introduction of the Rentenmarks in the German Empire, shops and stores now suddenly sprang up in Soviet Russia, overnight mysteriously stocked with delicacies Russians had not seen for years. As alternatives to the new rich the Ost artists produced portraits of film and theater directors, art architects, and actors. And we see here on the left side, Briotta Williams, for instance, painted a life-size portrait of Beresewald Meyerhold in 1925. He was the most well-known director of Soviet avant-garde theater, which was supposed to promote the reconstruction of everything that exists. The distinctive personality of the person depicted was underscored by the detailed psychologizing drawing of Meyerhold's facial features. This is contrasted with the smooth monochrome scaffolds, letters and catwalks, and three wide surfaces for film projections. The stage was supposed to metaphorically call to mind a construction site in the sense of the present being a construction site for the future. Uh, the, the theater was symbolically the construction site for the Soviet Union, to build up the Soviet Union. After Meyerhold theater was closed in 1937 under Stalinism, um, uh, you see on the right side, uh, it was closed and he was finally killed. So Piotr Konchalowski painted him lying on a chaise long in 1937. <clears throat> so everybody at that time knew uh, what's behind this painting. It looks so harmless, uh, but it's a political statement. <clears throat> Parallel to the contemporaries in Germany during the NEP period, which can be compared in many respects with the time of relative stabilization until 1929 in Germany, an urban, very satirical, but also constructively organized art prevailed above all among the members of these easel artists who are very similar to Neue Sachlichkeit. And um, with Lenin's death on January 21 in 1924, um, his dynamic model of a permanent revolution was replaced with a static model of socialism in one country. You can see here the painting at Lenin's coffin. You see the people in the Gewerkschaftshaus, in the trade union house, uh, passing by his cops. Um, yeah, this permanent revolution was replaced by socialism in one country, which had bid farewell to sorts of world revolution. With the erection of a monument to Leninism, Stalin also succeeded in embalming Lenin's dialectic, nimble thinking in a dogma of standstill. Until the early 1930s, Gustav Glutzis continued to depict the figure of Lenin on his posters as a dynamic figure, as a speaker with a raised, extended hand, as you can see here on this illustration, on this title uh, of, a, uh, of a magazine, The Young God, who sets the new society in motion as an organizing force of the party, 
but never as a static still image in the sense of a cult of personality. With a decision in favor of the first five-year plan in 1929, which initiated forced industrialization with the aim of total collectivization and the liquidation of the kulaks as glass, the party chose to take an unconditional leap forward without a chance of turning back. The second and final revolution, a war of hunger or civil war against its own population, ordered from above to which millions of people fell a victim, began after Stalin's 50th birthday in December 1929. To mark this occasion, he was conferred the title of washed leader, which had up to then been reserved for Lenin. In his new role, the uncharismatic Stalin, who had previously acted without attracting much attention, had to identify his person with the history of the party of Lenin. He now increasingly replaced the head of Lenin in mass agitation. Here on the left, uh, on Gustav Lutz's poster under the banner of Lenin for socialist construction, Lenin conceals half of Stalin's head, but Stalin is nonetheless clearly stepping out of his shadow. Uh, really, yeah. And on the right side, you see a typical poster for the five year plan. It's Nikolai Dolkorikov called with a better implement implementation of the financial plan. We will create a strong basis for industrialization in the East. That means East of the Ural in 1931. Using Magnitogorsk, which you can see on the, on the bottom, uh, the, the map on the bottom, you see uh, Magneto, uh, Magnitogorsk as an example. And the poster shows very uh, educational, uh, the various stages of planning. From a photograph of the tundra uh, left on, on the bottom left, <clears throat> to the model on the green felt of the Soviet bureaucracy, to the finished plant with its plan numbers in red. At the central place, workers are mounted as photomontages as a realizing force of the industrialization process. Glutzis created another poster the same year. Let's fulfill the plan of great works on which, based on a photo of a demonstration, the hands of workers come together precisely between the words of the slogan in one large pyramid-shaped hand in a dynamic position slanted towards the left. The totalitarian picture of the homogeneous body of the people is described by Shevgeny Samyatin in his dystopian novel, We, written in 1921, quote, United into a single body with a million hands at the very same second designated by the tables, we carry the spoons to our mouths. At the same second, we all go out for a walk, go to the auditorium, to the halls for the tailor exercises, and then to bed. Now we come to the central thesis of, of the book, Man and Machine, the machine produces the new man. The economic systems in all three countries were propelled by the principles of Americanism and Taylorism. Also in Soviet Union, also in Germany, the Americanism was a leading role model. And the unwavering belief in permanent progress. The crucial questions in the interwar period was Therefore, the extent to which man had to subordinate himself to the machine, or conversely, would control the machine. In all three countries, the United States, the Soviet Union, and the German Empire, the assessment of the role of man and machinery nonetheless differed fundamentally. Three paintings I show you now show factory landscapes with railway tracks leading into the picture diagonally in the new objective style. Beginning is the deserted scenery of the American photographer and painter Charles Schiele with a confusing title, Classic Landscape in 1931, which calls to mind the timeless landscape pictures of classicism. It constitutes a portrait of the Ford automobile plant on the Rouge River in Dearborn near Detroit, 
the biggest industrial complex in the world at that time. He worked on the sublime picture of modern America with photographic precision and a glazed painting technique that blurs every brush, brushstroke, brushstroke. In contrast to Schiller's deserted industrial landscape, in his painting Building New Factories in 1926, the Soviet painter Alexander Danica addressed the dynamic process of industrialization that was just getting started in the Soviet Union. In front of the filigree architecture with diagonal alignment points, the way to the to the still open future, showing the, the, the way to the still open future. Two female workers embody present and future. With her back to the fuel, the older of the two, wearing dirty clothing, clothing and with a muscular physique marked by heavy labor, maneuvers a wagon filled with coal, while opposite to her, at a higher position, stands a smiling young woman in an immaculate light blue dress. She looks triumphantly from the future at her colleague from the present, who still has to perform strenuous manual labor. The shining light of the blonde worker represents the ideal picture of the new man of the future, freed from hard physical labor. She seems more to float than to stand on the platform, which has a black surface that is difficult to comprehend spatially. Her skirt is moved by a light breeze, while her indeterminate gaze taking in the sphere of material production corresponds to the metaphorical character of the figure. <clears throat> the visibility of the shape of their bodies under their clothing emphasizes the contrast between the cold metallic housing of technology and the sensual organic presence of the human body. Karl Hupu uh, also emphasizes this contrast with when he places his swimmer of Cologne in front of the enormous riveted steel blades of the bridge across the Rhine. The soft organic body beneath the swimsuit is also visible here and contrasts with the metallic hardness of the bridge construction which blocks her access to the water and totally obscures the view of the river. While Hubuch has a swimmer obstructed by the steel fittings and isolated from the life-giving water, Danica, Danica's young female worker stands, um, like female worker stands free and unhindered in front of the dark background of the platform, which truly accentuates her appearance. Danica also shows that the factory halls are still actually under construction, precisely where the plan is becoming a reality at the point where the darker woman is turning the wagon. The monochrome bluish black point painting service breaks off and seeks towards the right into a construction drawing on a while on a white ground showing the still unfinished steel frame, steel framework of a side wing of a production hall. Denica suggests the possibility of bringing the future into the picture, but without already depicting it, like socialist realism as a present. The level, it's not the present, it's showing the model of the future. It's a promise, but it's not reality. The level of reality and the symbolic level are clearly differentiated, differentiated from one another and are nonetheless part of a whole. In contrast, he painted in 1947, on the right side here, the same topic in his painting Donbass in the style of socialist realism. In contrast to Schiller's deserted industrial landscape and Danica's homage to the future, uh, in Karl Völker's Industrie Build we, uh, from 1924, Picture of Industry, we encounter the proletariat as a physically and mentally crippled type of human being corralled into a convoluted industrial facility. This picture of industry exposes the differences between classes without whitewashing when in the left corner, the businessman stands dominant and venomously green in the role of a jailer who is keeping his eye on the workers on a bridge that is spanned in a used shape over and around the track system of an industrial railway. 
the situation examples a yard exercise for prisoners. Here, Völker, who also worked as an architect, addressed, addresses the alienation of people from their, from their work. For the Soviet art critic Fedorov Davidov, the picture of the German verists revealed a negative attitude toward technology and civilization. For them, machine culture is the downfall of human beings as a result of the machine. So he's really protesting against this kind of the German verism and said, it's warning the, the Soviet uh, artists uh, to follow them because he said the, the, the worker is a wonderful man. You can't show him uh, in this way as a crippled person. The American Soviet artists, in contrast, influenced by Fordism and Taylorism, designed a positive view of technology and machines in the sense of an emancipated, uh, and then as a, in the sense of emancipation of humankind. Unlike the Americans, the Soviet artists, however, always showed machinery in connection with the workers who operated it. And uh, in America, you find no persons. That's only the industrial landscape. On the left side, you see an illustration in the magazine Projector Scheinwerfer. Um, we uh, spotlight with the title Socialism, Henry Ford, in 1928. It has a subtitle quoting Henry Ford. Socialism has long existed in my factories and all employees have everything they need for life. Um, at that time, critique on American Taylorism still prevailed. And you can see this uh, really grotesque uh, caricature. These workers are hanging there with numbers. They have no human faces. And <laughs> Henry Ford having in his hand a stop uh, uh, the watch. But on the other side, here on the right side, you see how the architect and uh, artist Vladimir Grinsky praises Americanism. Let us take the storm of revolution in Soviet Russia, united with the pulse of American life, and let us do our work like a chronometer. That's written there. And it's the, the text is really following the, uh, the image. The machine is an instrument of liberation. It shapes the characteristics of the new man. The bourgeois individual becomes the Arbeiter, the worker by Ernst Jünger, by adapting his body to the machine. In the 1930s, America created a Superman for itself. In the Soviet Union, the image of Homo Sovieticus was given characteristics of Superman when Leo, Leo Trotsky explained that the revolution would make an indefatigable selection of the best, of the most courageous, of the consecrated elements of the working class and build its own party. You see on the right side, Rochenko's sports parade. And in 1928, the trained athletes of Gustav Klutz's Spartiata in Moscow uh, are seen here. There the are postcards, there are just two examples. And um, you see here Denika's man of the first five-year plan in 1936, and even more clearly of Gerhard Keil's Turner uh, gymnasts. 1939, the Turner Gymnasts here on the right side in Munich on this temple. Um, they are lined up with dejected earnestness, embodies a notion described by Ernst Jünger in his book, The Arbeiter, that sport today already has an entirely obvious work character. There is no free time in this way. Sport is part of the work. It's just renewing your working power. You see here Hans Wetzlaff, Reichsarbeitsdienst, Reichslabor Service, fixation and reforestation of the shifting dune near Ossikam and so on. And on the right side, Alexander Rochenko, construction of the White Sea Canal. This was a terrible uh, terrorist um, measure. This channel, this White Sea cha Canal was never used, uh, had no use at all. So, you see here Ernst Jünger, 
himself showing a portrait by Rudolf Schlichter in an icy mountain area. And on the right side, you see the type of the arbeiter, of the working man, of the worker, which he had in, in mind as he wrote the book, uh, The Worker. Uh, this is a, a photograph of the new man, if you like, uh, a pilot with his cameras uh, in the book The Changed World, a picture primer of our time, published in Breslau, 1933, today, Roslav. By 1933, the aims of the five-year plan had supposedly been achieved and the agrarian front consolidated. The incredible sacrifice involved in the forced industrialization and collectivization prompted Stalin in 1935 to change propaganda slogans. Technology decided everything, and now it's the persons, the characters decide everything. And uh, Viktor Slovsky declared in a self-criticism of the avant-garde uh, that we underestimated the human and the universal human character of the revolution. New Deal. Social conflicts in the United States intensified after the global economic crisis in October 1929. There was an enormous influx to the Communist Party. Strikes became more frequent. Economic output had declared nearly by half since 1929. Since there was no social insurance, the states and private charities were hopelessly overwhelmed with taking care of about 9 million unemployed individuals. President Herbert Hoover denied any help from the central government because he was convinced that any assistance for the unemployed would undermine work morale. He firmly believed in the American model of individual self-help and self-responsibility and in a balanced national budget. When even the states and the municipalities suspended debt repayment, the banks entered a state of crisis. Franklin Roosevelt took office with an emotional commitment against materialism and the capitalist financial system. Quote, the money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truth. The measure of the restoration lies in the extent to which we apply social values more noble than more mere monetary profits. First, on his speech, Roosevelt compared the situation of the country with the state of war. Quote, I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage war against the emergency, as great as a power that would be given me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. In March 1933, when the German Reichstag passed the Enabling Act, Roosevelt convened the Congress in Washington for a three-month special session while he enacted a series of executive orders. This process can be described as a vigorous reaction and as its tacit surrender, the broad-ranging powers granted to Roosevelt by Congress before that body went into recess were unprecedented in times of peace. These powers were only constrained by the legislative period and by the conservative Supreme Court, which, for instance, in January 1935 and in May 1936 declared 11 New Deal laws to be unconstitutional. During his first 100 days, Roosevelt also established a series of new government agencies, including the Works Progress Administration. It was a job creation authority per se and funded not only anti-cyclical construction activities, but also visual artists, writers, and theater professionals. Mexican mural painting was regarded as a model for the public promotion of visual art, which promised a renewal of American painting, a new feeling of community, a true American Renaissance. The artists who participated in the funding programs belonged to three movements. Uh, the motto of the conservative regionalist was paint American. The leftist, the leftist politically active socialist, 
social realists like Richard Lamarge, Philip Overgood, Ben Shan, who wrote Paint Proletarian on their flex. As city painters from New York, the socialist realists came into conflict above all politically with the rationalists who propagated the topos of the decadence of the city. And there were finally also the modernists, but they only played a marginal role. Irving Sandler emphasizes the almost revolutionary significance of, the, of state funding of the art, which with morals for every post office in the nation in the 1930s, made painting a popular mass art for the first time in America, even though with a conservative orientation. Yeah. I show you as an example, William Cropper, who was awarded a commission to execute the monumental mural construction of the dam, which you can see here. Um, construction of the dam for the US Department of the Interior in Washington, DC. From an extreme view from below, beholders see a panorama of a gigantic construction site. In the foreground, the chief engineer stands on a platform with his plan, while in front of him is a group of workers directing a large segment which hangs on the crane located outside the picture. The picture is enlivened, enlivened by the choreography of the workers moving acrobatically on the iron studs and rock faces. This is a pathos that we are also familiar with from the photo book Man at Work, which Louis Hein, and show you here, which Louis Hein published in 1932. Besides the pictures of direct contact between man and machine, it also shows the builders of the Empire State Building. This pathos is typical. It is supposed to disseminate enthusiasm and consequently calls to mind the works of socialist realism in the Soviet Union. It's interesting that William Cropper at the same time switched styles for the Moral Commission from the government since he was simultaneously making a name for himself as a social realist, you know, the, the image above, with his expressive critical paintings such as Young, Youngstown Strike from around 1937, with which he commemorated the bloody conflicts of 1916 in Youngstown, Ohio. There, company guards shot striking workers while he castigated capitalist society in caricatures and graphic work for new masses, he was prepared to propagate the large-scale development program of the New Deal with a positive pathos in the rooms of the government. Louis Hein incorporately decided to switch from critical social photography, child labor slums, to pictures of development to men at work, like here. The so commission pictures with their positive messages were nonetheless not able to conceal the fact that they were created during the time of depression. The social realists were also painting scenes of class struggle in peril. Philip Evergood's American Tragedy from 1937, for instance, concentrates on the events of the infamous Memorial Day massacre during the steelworker strike in Chicago. Evergood's painting Dance Marathon took up a phenomenon of the 1920s that got out of hand during the years of the Depression. Couples literally danced for days, weeks, and months until they collapsed. Those who lasted the longest received prize money, which was announced on a red banner hanging above the dance band, couple $1,000, solo dancer 500. The dance marathon was a particularly perfidious form of entertainment for the sensation-seeking public at the expense of the unemployed. Directly to the left, next to the band, one sees a first aid station with a nurse dressed in white. Above her in capital letters stands Walkerton. Moralists insinuated that the dance marathons were sexually suggestive events with a bad influence on the morals of young people. It is for this reason that the organizers invented this, this neutral term, Walkerton. To the right, at the stage, we see a clock with a Mickey Mouse below it, 
which as a symbol of the rationalization of working hours also plays a central role in the pictures of Oskar Nerlinger, the stars and their Arbeit, the streets of work. Above, above the clock, uh, a sign displays 49 day, which is how long the marathon has already been going on. We also see a circular dance floor with wooden planks called to mind a spider web. Caught in the web of sensual, sensationalism, <clears throat> the dancing couples are clinging to and supporting one another more than they are truly dancing. Their bodies are contorted and overstrained, comparable with mannerist figures a la Parmigianino or El Greco. The heavily made up faces are frozen like masks. The little carnival heads and the figure con accentuating clothing seem grotesque. The skeleton hand extending a thousand dollar bill into the picture from the upper left evokes associations with the dance of death. In the foreground, we see sensation seeking spectators sadistically taking in the torments of the sleep starved dancers with only their hands visible on the railing. The painter of magical realism, uh, Luis Guglielmi, is on the right side was part of a group of social surrealists in America that highlighted uncanny dark sides of the American scene in their pictures. They conveyed sadness and melancholy regarding the perhaps one hoped for and now lost paradise of America. Vanitas motifs are evident in this painting, portrait and background, Phoenix in 1935. In the endless desert landscape of the US state of Arizona, whose capital is Phoenix, we see in the background a bleak set piece of industry which represents old industry with its slack heaps and smoking chimneys. In front of it is a pile of construction rubble along with an oil canister from which a flayed and in the heat put putrefied arm produced, produce. In front of the smokestack constructed as a pyramid with its top truncated stands the lattice of an oil derrick on which a large format portrait of Lenin is propped up. This portrait quotes the portrait of Lenin in the mural Man at the Crossroads by Diego Rivera at Rockefeller Center in New York, of which only a black and white photograph exists. The client, Nelson Rockefeller, had asked Rivera to expunge Lenin from the mural. You see only this part of the painting, of the wall painting. When he refused, the entire fresco was destroyed in February 1934. As a communist sympathizer, Sam Guglielmi condemned this act of censorship and declared his solidarity with Rivera. That's why he's quoting this part of the painting. Um, the oil derrick refers to the source of Rockefeller's wells the family that established the Standard Oil Company, the first multinational corporation. The Lenin band from Rockefeller Center in front of the oil derrick may, as Sarah Burns suggests, therefore be clearly understood as a call for the American labor movement to repudiate Rockefeller. Lenin would then be the proverbial phoenix from the ashes, which symbolized by the stalk of corn as the only sign of life in this death soon promises a revival of an America ravaged by capitalism. In Germany, on the left side, you see Franz Ratzewill painted the strike, 1931. The painting shows a similar deserted scene, like a memento mori with a coffin in the middle of the street. Now I come to the end. <laughs> um, uh, return home from the cold and the new war. With the death of Foreign Minister Gustav Stresemann, 1929, the period of relative stabilization in Germany came to an end. Stresemann had found an elegant solution to the question of reparations. The German Empire paid them with loans from abroad, above all from the United States. After Black Thursday on uh, October uh, 1929. However, all of a sudden, no more loans came from America, which had financed not only the reparations, but investments as well. 
total protectionism now prevailed between the countries in the Americas and Europe. The volume of world trade fell by 25% in 1932, and German exports went down from 13 to 5.7 billion Reichsmark. Germany faced state bankruptcy several times. Following the inflation of 1923, the country was hit by a second catastrophic economic crisis with over 6 million people soon unemployed. National conservative, national socialist and communist forces blamed the liberal Weimar system of the golden twenties for the economic debacle. There was a correspondingly great need, great need for intellectual leadership and guidance in the chaos of the clashing intellectual and political ideologies. One constant in all of Hitler's speeches was the identification of the extreme disintegration of form in the arts parallel to the crisis in society. With this, he addressed a sentiment that was widespread among the bourgeoisie. The economic crisis fostered a longing for historical styles such as Romanticism and Biedermeier, the genre realism of the 19th century and Classicism as maintainers of order. Since the tendency to re-establish the old and the tried and tested in art did not result from Hitler's cultural policy, but was instead a product of the one and the same historical crisis that led to the victory of National Socialism as well. The avant-garde had left behind a hollow mental space that others knew how to fill with their ideology. Karl Einstein began to fundamentally doubt the function of art and the undertakings of intellectuals. Quote, the new formations of the modern era were actually negative. It is no longer possible to stand on one's head and completely subordinate oneself to theoretical ut utopias. A social re reality must once again be one, nothing more. And he noted self-critically about the middle class to which he also belonged. One morning, the intellectuals woke up as wretched, unemployed persons. They had played with reality in a reckless way and overestimated the possibilities. The minority speculatively gambled away the illusions of its own existence in poker. There had long since been a boom in books about the crisis. It had begun a permanent state. In Germany, many painters of Neue Sachlichkeit quickly switched to magical realism with its tendency toward classicism. Artists also pursued careers in the national socialist state, such as Werner Peiner, you can see here, who was, he was part of Neue Sachlichkeit, New Objectivity, who received commissions for paintings from the national socialist. Coming from a romantic conservative wing, with representatives like Alexander Carnold, Franz Lenk, or Georg Schrimpf, it was regarded by NS art ideologies as a new art of quiet objectivity, which represented a sign of healing after, this, after the destructive work of expressionism. This silent objectivity corresponded to clarity. To be German means to be clear, as an essential characteristic of the German art demanded by the Führer. In his painting, Peiner's painting Feldarbeit Fieldwork, Peiner partitioned the landscape into an exact grid with the meticulously painted lines of the fields. Nature was symbolically subjected to German order as a timeless symbol of the German spirit on the German landscape. Despite the att attempts to incorporate Neue Sachlichkeit into the NS art system, it found no continuation due to its urban and liberal form. Reichsminister, Reich Minister of the Interior, Wilhelm Frick, declared in the Völkische Beobachter, 1933, quote, the spirit of disruptiveness, an end must today, <clears throat> an end must today also be put to such ice cold, utterly un-German constructions that operate under the name of Neue Sachlichkeit. In the NS system, a fourth Reconciliation of technology and nature, city and countryside, so as to form an organic whole, was regarded as a guiding principle, as Georg Simmel also invoked in his speech of 1914, which I 
quoted in the beginning of my talk. The American ritualists sought answers to the questions of a new equilibrium in the same time of a sort of synthesis between city and countryside, industry and agriculture, modern technology and human pre-industrial cultures in their own very different way. In paintings like Fall Blowing from Grant Wood, who grew up on a farm, conjures up the pastoral ideal of America as a rediscovered natural paradise from which the noble yeoman has, however, disappeared. There are deserted landscapes in which the blow remains without a blowman, as you can see in the middle of the painting. Confronted with the impositions before and during the time of the Third Reich, Germans also fantasized about an as it once was and how it might be, believing that they might overcome the separation from traditional ties by escaping into the fabricated myths of the origin of the Reich. From an authoritarian Führer as Almighty Father, the masses anticipated themselves being forcibly shaped into a Volksgemeinschaft, a national community, with which the lost harmony and the sense of security would be restored as false reconciliation. The success of this dominion, domin, dominion over the masses can be attributed to the specific German congruence of archaic myths and the most modern means behind the folksy, folkische facade. Germany experienced a second push for rationalization and modernization under an NS regime. Images of the deployed masses can be found in photographs by Rochenko, as we have seen, as in the same way as Rochenko, uh, in Leni Riefenstahl's propaganda films, uh, which you can see here, for the Nuremberg Valley, for instance, Triumph des Willens, Triumph of the Will. Meeting Aufmarsch der Nullen, Parade of the Zeros by Werner Held, which he drew around 1935 while in exile in Mallorca, Held was fascinated by the thousand-headed mass of people with their blank faces whose spontaneous tumult might be transformed into a lockstep at any time. Ultimately, everything pointed to war. Full employment was achieved in Germany in 1936, thanks to the accelerated arms production and then the eruption of war that resulted from Germany's attack on Poland. And in America after 1939, thanks to the deliveries of weapons to England and the Soviet Union, and later as a result of the country's entry into the war. Karl Arns and Dimitri Moore both show the mechanisms on interest in mobilizing the masses for war. Here you see in Moore's work, let's expose the anti-Soviet plans of capitalists and churchmen, long live the proletarian world revolution. The Pope becomes a hyena defending its interest with the teeth and claws of a predator. Gerd Arndt's line, Cut was a fatherland demonstrates the transformation of workers into soldiers, ending as corpses on the battlefield. A hybrid creature that also radiates horror is found at the center of Foto Schlichter's painting, Blind Power. The heroes of history are being mobilized for the impending war. Sorry, standing uh, for the impending yeah, you see left, uh, you see Schlichter, blind, mach, blind power. And on the right side, you see Pavel Korin painted Alexander Nevsky in 1942 during the war, who was venerated in Russia as a vanquisher of the Knights of the Teutonic Order on the ice of Lake Pipus in 1242, and as a saint in the Russian Orthodox Church. The NS regime also made use of the memory of heroes from history with exhibitions such as Great Germans at the Deutsche Museum in Munich. Finally, Clarence Carter's Warbright in 1940 stands in a pure white bridal gown in a grim machine room filled with steel coffins in front of a monstrous machine behind which a red light glows. It might be a monumental crematorium for processing fallen soldiers or a gigantic metal press. Parts of the machine on the right 
and left look like eyes. Here, man, machine, and death come together. So I come to the end. The end of the war found Bertolt Brecht strained, stranded on the Pacific in Los Angeles, in this city defined by the capitalist dream factory, where he hoped in vain for screenplay commissions, the writer tried to convert the Communist Manifesto in, for, into verse. Brecht stopped working on this Lehrgedicht, didactic poem, in September 1945. While Brecht proposed destroying the whole construction of the world in this uh, didactic poem and rebuilt it from below in the name of Marx, um, the philosopher Bruno Latour, the French philosopher Bruno Latour, who died recently, argues in his terrestrial manifesto for cautious rebuilding, not for an overthrow of the world like Brecht proposed. We have a stop wanting to be, we have to stop wanting to be absolutely modern, instead of, as up to now, always neatly separating the old from the new with the clever. We have to understand, instead of that, it is, it is uprooting that is illegitimate, not belonging belonging to a piece of land, wanting to remain on it, to care for a piece of earth, to be bound to it. All this has become reactionary only because it stands in sharp contrast to the escape towards the future forced by modernization. Latour fundamentally calls into question this incomplete project of modernism. For how can a modernization project that forgot to anticipate directions of the globe to human actions for 200 years be considered realizable and progressive. I thank you very much now at the end. <laughs> thank you so much, Eckhart. I, um, yeah, uh, this is a lot of food for thought. And um, I think, thank you for almost everyone for staying with us, uh, even though we weren't very much over the one hour that we usually, um, uh, uh, that our events usually take. I would like to add another maybe five minutes so uh, people can ask their questions. So please um, put your questions in the, in the chat or the uh, function or in the Q&A. Uh, for a really short uh, additional discussion of the many interesting things that we just heard. Um, Tim says, thank you for a wonderful survey full of insights. Could you say more about the sources, cynical reason? Uh, and do you think it lingers or resurges at the end of the dec decade when economies collapse, or does Karl Einstein suggest another direction? Um, can you repeat, sorry, um, you mean um, the first sentence? Could you say more about the sources of cynical reason? And do you ah, think it sources, lingers yeah. or resurges mm. at the end of the decade when economies collapse? Or does Karl Einstein suggest another direction? Mm -hmm. well, Karl Einstein, he was finally um, collapsed with his philosophy. He was uh, very on the side of surrealism and believed in, um, uh, yeah, in, a, in, in this cubism and construction. And he, he, his thinking was collapsing after take, uh, taking off, uh, taking over the power by the by the Nazis, and he, um, yeah, he went to France. He was part of the Spanish uh, civil war, and finally uh, committed uh, suicide. So he just committed that he he. he, he he failed. He's thinking he was completely um, down. Uh, and um, so, like him, many, many other intellectuals were, uh, were thinking. So, this um, cynical thinking of the early 20s uh, finally um, failed. Yeah. 
that's that's the truth. Mm -hmm. So does um, so do new ideologies and new ideas um, sprout or? Uh, is there um, going back to, I think you, you said that there's a very strong, that there was a very strong uh, resurgence, uh, resurgence of uh, conservative um, thinking. Um, yeah. Is that a natural, is that a natural reaction? Well, not? the problem was, in Germany, the problem was that um, this, left-wing artists and intellectuals were a minority. They were uh, within, you know, in a small circle. And uh, of course, they were very present in, in books and in, in magazines. But in fact, uh, the universities were very nationalist. Uh, the students were nationalists and uh, the professors were nationalists and the society was never really on the side of this uh, uh, left-wing uh, artist. It was a very small scene in Berlin, and uh, it was really on a, on a small island. Yeah, They were isolated, but they didn't realize that. And George Gross is the best example for that, because he really said, I failed with all my, my drawings. Yeah? And also uh, writers... Uh, like Walter Mehring said, well, I'm 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 failed with my 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 uh, poems and with my texts. Uh, I'm not under. I was not understood. It was for nothing. It was blowing in the wind. It was, um, uh, and they realized that maybe too late. Yeah, that they were very isolated, uh, and it was just within the Communist Party that was a strong force, of course. But still, even in the communist parties, they were isolated because they couldn't follow the Stalinist um, uh, Stalinist uh, direction, which was already uh, within the communist party, dominated, uh, dom uh, dominating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, were there also influences from the U.S.? Um, responsible for that or not at all? No, not at all. I mean, the, the United States, well, many uh, film directors went there because they, of course, earned more money and there was much more freedom for them as they realized, you know, it started already in the late 20s, 1929, 30. Um, there, the, the Nazis and the, and the communist Stalinists uh, were dominating the streets, and um, so I think, yeah, the, the, the United States was a kind of possibility to escape, um, and it was not negative. And they were mm -hmm. already, of course, the United States were investing a lot of dollars uh, and keeping up uh, the economy in in, uh, in the Weimar Republic. For, for example, they paid the, uh, uh, the money which has to be paid to France and England from Germany as um, reparations. Uh, but then finally, 1929, it was the end. And then we had the custom war and um, the world trade collapsed. Mm -hmm. And then of course came back to the whole uh, cultural production. There was a backlash to the cultural production. And uh, well, it started not only in 1933, it started earlier. It started already after 1929. Stresemann died, then we had the world uh, economic collapse, and then it was the end of the liberal culture in the Weimar Republic. Mm. Yeah. And the same was in, in, in Soviet Union. Also, um, with the end um, of the new, uh, new economic policy, it was also in 1928. Uh, then we had the five-year plan, and then was a complete uh, end of all forms of um, liberal economy also in the Soviet Union. It was the same time. 
Mm-hmm. And in America and the United States, it was the opposite. It was this Roosevelt, a new uh, possibility to um, find a new uh, balance, uh, social balance between the classes and, and the, uh, there's a new deal. It was a mm-hmm. real new deal for everybody uh, and also for the unemployed, um, for the artists. And they had these programs paying state money right. for post office murals and so on. Right, right. Thank you so much, Eckhart. Again, a lot of uh, food for thought. 